so um, <clears throat> so I will summarize briefly what uh, we were left with uh, during the previous lecture. So we um, we talked about uh, supercurrent multiplets. Uh, and specifically, we focused uh, on the case of uh, n equal 1 uh, field theories in 4D. <coughs> so supercurrent multiplets is the multiplet which contains uh, the supercurrent, which integrates to the supercharges, and uh, the energy momentum tensor um, of the theory. Uh, but uh, as we saw, this multiplet uh, contains uh, a variety of uh, other operators. So in particular, the most uh, general multiplet which uh, these theories possess, which uh, goes under the name of the S-multiplet, uh, contains, besides the energy momentum tensor and the supercurrent, contains a variety of uh, other uh, operators, uh, among which uh, there is a, a string current, which is determined in terms of a two-form, which is uh, closed. Um, then, uh, there is uh, also a um, domain wall current, which is determining, which is given in terms of a one form Y, which is complex and also closed. And uh, finally, uh, there is an arc current which is not conserved, generically conserved, indeed a generic n equal one field theory in four dimensions does not need to have an R symmetry, uh, then there is a real scalar. So these are 16 bosonic degrees of freedom, and then there are uh, correspondingly, uh, okay, well, these are not bosonic. Uh, so okay, there are 16 bosonic degrees of freedom, and then there are also 16 fermionic degrees of freedom. In particular, besides the supercurrent, you also have uh, fermions psi alpha and psi bar alpha dot. <coughs> and uh, uh, as we saw, this string current and the uh, uh, brain current, the, the domain wall current, will like appear. Uh, so the corresponding charges will appear uh, in the superalgebra. And uh, we wrote down the resulting superalgebra. where we have the usual momentum appearing, and then this string charge, which is obtained by integrating the string current. And similarly, in the Q alpha, Q beta anti-commutator, you find the appearance of the domain wall charge. Okay, <coughs> so this is. Uh, we also looked at what kind of improvements the uh, supercurrent can uh, um, can be subjected to, and uh, so we found out that, uh, <coughs> like also the improvements can be uh, treated in a supersymmetric fashion, and we have started. Um, describing uh, possible uh, 
particular instances in which this uh, uh, supercurrent can be improved to a shorter multiplet. Um, okay, so there are So for instance, uh, so, so we discussed two different uh, uh, scenarios. Uh, so the first scenario uh, happens when this uh, form uh, F, instead of being just close, uh, it is uh, also exact. And uh, then uh, that means that uh, the, there is no, um, that the string current can be um, uh, can be improved away, and the one is left with uh, a smaller multiplet, uh, which is uh, called the Ferrara Zumino uh, supercurrent multiplet. And uh, this uh, Ferrara Zumino supercurrent multiplet contains less than uh, 16 bosonic and 16 fermionic degrees of freedom. Indeed, there are only 12 plus 12 uh, degrees of freedom. So, uh, what happens is that there is no um, yeah, so there is no string current, so there is no f, and also like there is a relation uh, between uh, a and um, and the trace of the of the energy momentum tensor. <coughs> so So in particular, we <laughs> saw that uh, there are cases, uh, there are uh, uh, examples of uh, field theories uh, which, uh, do no, which do not have uh, a Ferrara Zumino supercurrent. Uh, namely, uh, if you consider a best Zumino model uh, whose target space uh, is compact, this uh, cannot have uh, a Ferrara Zumino supercurrent because the two form F is going to be proportional to the form and it's going to be therefore closed but not exact and uh, so in general whenever the killer form of some Vesumino model is closed but not exact then you have um, you cannot improve the S multiplet to the uh, uh, Ferrara Zumino uh, multiplet. <coughs> uh, okay uh, there is also another uh, example uh, of um, a field theory which uh, does not uh, allow for a Ferrara Zumino supercurrent, uh, and that is obtained by just uh, taking the case of a U1. So let's do another example. So if you consider some U1 gauge theory. with an Fi term. So then your Lagrangian is going to include the usual field strength part. Plus complex conjugate. And then there is also the Fi term. OK, this is in usual superfield terminology, um, then one can show that uh, for this theory, uh, one can write down um, one can write down the supercurrent multiplet, and in particular the um, the two form f, which appears in the string current, is proportional to the <coughs> phi parameter times uh, the field strength of the gauge field. Uh, hence, uh, because the gauge field, um, so if it were possible to improve away the, uh, this, uh, this F menu, then it would mean that it has to be um, 
It has to be exact, but it's not <coughs> because uh, A by itself is not gauge invariant. So this is another example uh, of uh, a theory which cannot uh, have a supercurrent which is improvable to the uh, FC, FC kind. And indeed, uh, in one of the exercises, you could check that uh, you could uh, couple the, this, uh, you could consider uh, SQAD, <coughs> so the U1 gauge field coupled to uh, matter. And then you can uh, check that uh, this theory does indeed uh, have uh, string configurations uh, which uh, carry this uh, string charge. Okay. <coughs> So the other case that we uh, took into consideration uh, is the case where instead of being able to improve away the string current, you are, away, you are, you are able to uh, improve away the uh, domain wall current. And in particular, we found that uh, there is another multiplet uh, which exists whenever the theory has uh, a conserved R symmetry. So when this current, which appears in the multiplet, is conserved, then again the multiplet shortens and uh, becomes uh, includes only uh, 12 bosonic degrees of freedom and 12 fermionic degrees of freedom. <coughs> so these theories, um, I mean, clearly. Like, you cannot have such a multiplet if your theory does not have uh, um, conserved um, um, R symmetry. So, for instance, uh, one example could be if I take some Vesuminum uh, model with some uh, generical uh, cubic or even non cubic superpotential, like this will not uh, have an R symmetry, therefore, it will not have. And our multiplet. Another example, which is uh, maybe more interesting, is that of uh, pure Young Mills. So, if you take supersymmetric Young Mills, like the R, the R symmetry uh, would be anomalous, and then this theory would not have um, an R multiplet. Okay. <coughs> so, in both these cases, then when a theory of an FC multiplet, then uh, there is no uh, string charge in the, in the algebra, and uh, vice versa, in the case that the theory has an R multiplet, then there would be no domain wall charge in the supersymmetric, supersymmetry algebra. <coughs> we can also think about uh, theories which, uh, both, which have both an FC multiplet and uh, an R multiplet. Uh, so certainly there are uh, there are such theories. Um, uh, so in these theories, you wouldn't have either domain wall charges or uh, string charges. And uh, then uh, it may be that the improvement that you need to make the S multiplets the FC multiplet and the improvement that you need to make the S multiplet the R multiplet actually do coincide. And then it is possible to uh, get rid of uh, short and even further the multiplet. So that's the third possibility. So this happens um, when you can get rid of the both this field chi superfield chi alpha and the y alpha in the definition of the of the S multiplet. <coughs> and this happens for theories which are super conformal. So indeed, if you look at the conditions that needed to be satisfied in order to have uh, an FC multiplet, and you combine them with those that need to be satisfied uh, in order to uh, have an R multiplet, then you will discover that the well, clearly the R symmetry has to be conserved. But also, so to have an FC multiplet, this uh, scalar field A had to be proportional to the trace of the energy momentum tensor. But to have a NAR multiplet, this field A has to be zero. So that means that the trace of the energy momentum tensor is equal to A. 
and this also uh, equal to zero, <coughs> then you don't have uh, you don't have a string current, nor you have a domain wall current. So f d nu is equal to zero. Y mu is equal to zero. <coughs> And uh, there are also uh, conditions uh, on the on the fermions, namely, uh, what you find is that uh, uh, psi alpha is equal to zero and uh, sigma mu s bar uh, is equal to zero, and um, similarly for psi bar and s. <coughs> So these are indeed the conditions that need to be satisfied for like uh, the supercurrent to actually be as. If I do a shock breaking just by adding masses, like yeah. what we had yesterday from Berkeley, uh, which ones should I keep? Up? Well, that depends on which multiple you want. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, suppose that... The needles or no? Just for yeah. shock breaking? No, so uh, if you do a soft breaking, then like the trace of the energy momentum tensor won't be zero, and these guys will not, uh, and this guy in particular will not stay zero. So you will have to, yeah, then you will have to fall into one of the um, larger multiplets. Okay, so this is uh, for super conformal. Um, Theories. But is it possible to get rid of just the domain wall charge, for example, while keeping the J mu, for example? Uh, what is J mu? I mean, J, J mu is the, non the U on R current. Yeah, so that's the R multiplet. Uh, sorry, no, oh. I'm, not, sorry I'm, not, I'm keeping that not to be non conserved, <coughs> but just eliminate, say, domain wall charge. I, I mean, th there are many ingredients, so you can, there seems to be many options of which one to eliminate. Right, so as, uh, as discussed, so there, is, there are two possible ways to do it consistently with supersymmetry. One reduces to the ferrara zumino supercurrent, and the other one uh, reduces to the, to the R multiplet. Okay, but th those are the only possibilities? Yeah, those are the only two shortenings. Oh, I see. Right. Well, and the SCFT shortening, which includes both. <coughs> so, 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 so if you introduce a, a super potential mass, yeah. Then that would break R symmetry. Right. So if you yeah. right. So so for instance, if you let, let's take this uh, let's take this theory. Um, so this theory is uh, the the U one gauge theory with a phi term. Like uh, okay, it has an R symmetry. So indeed, you can write for this uh, particular theory. You can write down uh, the uh, some R multiplet. Um, Indeed, I think the, the R multiplet is going to be just uh, given by the following expression. Okay. But uh, then suppose you couple this theory to matter and you take some generic superpotential so that uh, the R symmetry is broken, then this theory will not have an R multiplet anymore, but it will only have an S multiplet. So indeed, the most generic, the most generic theory will have an S multiplet, and then there are more special theories that uh, uh, allow for Ferrara Zumino supermultiplets or for R multiplets, and then in the intersection there are some more even special theories that are conformal. Yeah. What happens if this conservation condition is broken by anomaly? That's the same. So, for instance, you could consider the case of uh, n equal one uh, super yamils, pure super yamils. So, classically, it has an R symmetry, but uh, it's broken by the anomaly. So that means that uh, this theory does not have uh, an R multiplet. I think all we use is uh, the algebra. So. No, but this is, okay, uh, so, that, th so let me comment on this in, in a second. <coughs> um, so, a, okay, so these are the three possible, um, possible shortenings. So 
He... Well, that's not if they're if they're parameters dynamic or suppose if it's a modular or some other cube, for example. Right. Um, it's a conclusion stays the same. I'm asking partly because people discuss the, for example, FI parameter in the context of detail equation and cutting to supergraphically, and then uh, they seem to say that. Uh, yeah, so if uh, if you have a theory which generates some uh, that in the infrared there's some U1 gauge field with uh, FI parameters, that means that this theory cannot have uh, uh, cannot have an FC multiplet. Okay. So this cannot happen if you start. Okay. So let me just make this uh, comment uh, now because it's uh, it already arose twice. So I should. Um, should address it. So, so one one application of this uh, of these ideas uh, is that to uh, put constraints on the RG flows of like some theory that you are interested in, or in general. And. So let me talk about oops, constraints on RG flows. Uh, so the idea is that the uh, supercurrent multiplet uh, of a theory uh, is uh, some kind of short multiplet. Or alternatively, you can say that like uh, the supercurrent is embedded in a superfield which needs to satisfy some constraints. Um, so then, uh, this means that the structure of the supercurrent multiplet is uh, preserved along the RG flow. So it does. Um, so if you start from like the nearly UV with the theory which has uh, an FC multiplet, then this theory will have an FC multiplet. Uh, all along uh, the RG flow, and the same is true for like a theory which has which has an R multiplet. <coughs> so when you get to the so so the structure is uh, conserved along the RG flow. So there is a comment here that, uh, so first of all, like um, if you start in the actual UV, then s suppose you have some asymptotically free theory, then there you will have a free theory which is also conformal. And then you might think that, well, this is does not really follow these rules. But actually, what you have to think about is like uh, n the theory at any high energy, uh, very high energy, but not infinite. And then, like uh, the statement applies, and uh, the other caveat is what happens in the extreme IR. So in the extreme IR, uh, like your theory could, like uh, be some uh, uh, SCFT. So in that case, what happens is that some of the uh, operators in the um, in the supercurrent might become redundant. So they like they just decouple. Like they they have uh, they don't have uh, correlators at uh, at separated points. Um, so, but in between the just uh, up to when you get to the deep deep IR, like your uh, theory will have uh, the, the structure of the multiplet uh, will uh, stay the same. <coughs> so, in particular, that means that uh, for instance, you, you can determine what the structure of the multiplet is by just doing some uh, computation in the UV. Uh, so now this computation need not, I mean, does not just have to be a uh, classical computation. It might include quantum effects or non-perturbative effects, but those must be, uh, it must be a possible computation in the UV. So for instance, for 
uh, the case of superior mills, like a uh, classical it would have uh, an R multiplet because it has conserved R current, but if you include quantum effects, you discover that uh, the um, there is no uh, R symmetry current, and then <coughs> the theory does not have uh, an R multiplet. Uh, it, however, uh, does have uh, an FC multiplet, and indeed, uh, in the the, the theory has like uh, set n, so if you consider <coughs> SUN super young mills, it will have n distinct vacua, and there will be supersymmetric domain walls that interpolate between the various vacua. So that means that uh, the theory does allow for a domain wall charge, and then, uh, but not for a string charge because it has no, uh, because it doesn't have an R multiple. Uh, okay. So, so, uh, so, so between case one and case two, is there a difference between how the theories can be coupled to supergravity? Like yeah, so that's, uh, so that's the other, so, okay, so that's the first comment. But le let me just uh, say some more things about this, so that f this, this can be used to, like, constrain the behavior of theories, like, uh, quite a lot. So, for instance, if you start uh, with a theory which has a uh, ferrara zumino uh, supercurrent, uh, then uh, you know that uh, it will not develop uh, FI terms for U1. So in the, in the IR, there could be some emergent U1, uh, some emergent U1, and then you could say, oh, maybe this emergent U1 will have uh, FI terms, but that cannot happen because then the theory will lose its uh, FC multiplet. And uh, the same thing can be said for like possible, suppose that the IR description of this theory is given by some Vesumino model, then you could uh, ask about like uh, its uh, uh, target space. And uh, well, what we just said, it says if the theory is an FC multiplet, then like uh, the target space of this uh, Vesumino model that you have in the IR cannot uh, have, uh, um, um, cannot have a compact uh, cannot be compact because if it were compact, then the um, the Keller form would not be exact, and that cannot happen if the theory is an FC multiplet. So, so there are all sorts of statements that uh, you can make by just using the structure of the multiplet on the behavior of the theory along the RG flow. And then the other comment that we want to make is that indeed, eventually, we are interested in coupling. some n equal 1 supersymmetric theory to supergravity. And then uh, the structure of the multiplet actually dictates uh, which supergravity you have to couple to. So in particular, there is uh, the s most common uh, supergravity for n equal 1 field theories. This is called old minimal supergravity. So in old minimal supergravity, if you count the bosonic uh, uh, degrees of freedom, uh, there are 12 of them. And indeed, this couples to theories which have an FC multiplet. So this is appropriate for theories with an FC multiplet. <coughs> so and in particular, you cannot couple to old minimal supergravity uh, any Vesumino model which uh, has a compact um, target space. Um, also, you cannot couple to old minimal supergravity a uh, U1 gauge theory with uh, an FI term. Then there is another version of uh, supergravity which is called new minimal supergravity. I guess it's new because it was newer when it was invented. And um, the, and it, so this, uh, this version of supergravity, which we will describe more, well, we'll describe a little bit more of them in more detail. Uh, this couples to the R multiplet. So you can use it whenever you have a theory which has a conserved R symmetry. <coughs> now, both the old minimal supergravity and new minimal supergravity have uh, 12 bosonic and 12 fermionic degrees of freedom. 
and uh, so they can couple to these short, shorter multiplets. And then the question arises of uh, what happens for a theory which doesn't have either a FC multiplet nor an R multiplet, as for instance, some gauge theory, U1 gauge theory with Fi terms and generic superpotential. So then, in that case, in order to couple to supergravity, you have to use a non-minimal supergravity, uh, which has more degrees of freedom in it. So this is uh, called 1616 supergravity. And this couples to the S multiplet. So the price you pay is that you have a longer multiplet and therefore your supergravity contains more fields. And well, you can also go in the other direction and if you have an SCFT then you can couple it to conformal supergravity uh, which, is, which has less, less fields. <coughs> now one, one um, important point I guess is that if you look at uh, old minimal supergravity and new minimal supergravity, then it is true that they are different, but uh, the difference only arises in like uh, auxiliary fields. So if you integrate out the auxiliary fields, they are actually equivalent. So on shell, they are equivalent. Oh, sorry, not these two. These two supergravities are equivalent on shell. But because we are interested in like, we will be interested in like uh, backgrounds, so in considering the fields of supergravity as like uh, fixed backgrounds, then we will work off shell and therefore the two formalism, all the old minimal supergravity and new minimal supergravity are actually not equivalent. Okay, uh, are there any questions on well, there is a somewhat similar story in four dimensional n equals two. Okay. Uh, yeah, so in the fourth. And then you have a supercurrent, so the current is a multiplet, and uh, I think it has a, a submultiplet, it has an anomaly multiplet. And uh, for super conformal theory, the anomaly multiplet becomes redundant. Yes, so also for n equal so you could repeat this story for like uh, theories with a different amount of supersymmetries and then. Uh, it would be it would be similar. Uh, well, clearly the details would change, uh, but uh, but yeah. So you can also have uh, uh, supercurrent multiplets for n equal two field theories. Uh, the most common one is called the Sonius multiplet, and uh, it contains like the conserved SU two R symmetry in it. Uh, but then, like if the theory becomes super conformal, then the multiplet shortens. And uh, indeed, like you lose the, end, the trace of the energy momentum tensor you lose, you also acquire another conserved U1 um, because there is, a, there is also, then the R symmetry becomes S2R times U1R and, uh, and so on. <coughs> so, so, but in the 16-16 super app, we are not just adding auxiliary Q, we're adding a... Uh, yeah, so in the 16... Yeah, so one way you can think about the 1616 supergravity is that you take some, you basically have, uh, you, you have one of, uh, you take new minimal supergravity and then like you add an extra chiral field uh, that you use as, uh, as compensator. So indeed, yes, there are, there is more propagating stuff. So the 1616 super is not uh, <coughs> irreducible. Irre irreducible. Yeah, 16, 16 is super gravity multiplet. Is irreducible or reducible? Well, it couples to this multiplet that, as we discussed, is in gen generically not uh, not reducible. But the super gravity looks like reducible. You just said it Again, this might be something which has to do with like uh, imposing the equation of motion. I'm I'm not sure. And also there is a <coughs> constraint to equal one super multiplet in which you can replace uh, 
one of the real field in terms of bilinear fermions? Uh, I don't know about that. Like a flow of work of multiple. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe I can answer. Yeah, yeah we, we, can, we can talk about that later. Um, I mean, are you talking about... Okay, yeah, let's talk about that later. Okay, so... Uh, so are there any more questions about this... Um, this different supercurrent multiplets? Sorry, I don't understand the question. Said that the, the various versions of the supercurrent multiple dictate how we can couple the theory to supergravity. Why is that? No, just because, like, given the structure of the super multiple, you have to choose a different supergravity to couple to. So, um, for instance, at the lin so, for instance, at the linear level, like uh, you would, uh, you would have some. Um, some coupling of the so if you do linearized supergravity Excuse me, that's yeah all right it's the light so then like so you suppose you start with some theory in flat space and then you want to couple it to linearized supergravity so that like at first order, you would add a coupling of the supercurrent multiplet as mu. To some superfield H mu, which contains the linearized metric. And then depending on which constraints uh, as mu satisfies, that changes the nature of the uh, metric superfield. So that's uh, one way to see the difference at linearized order. Then, I mean, if you want to do the full nonlinear theory, you have to work harder. Oh, sorry, one more <coughs> quick question. Just to make sure I understand your statement that the structure is preserved along the RG flow, yeah. does that mean if there exists a shortening condition on the S multiple at any point on the RG flow, then it must exist all along the flow? Is, yes. that, is that the equivalent statement? Yeah. So that it, it. Yeah. So uh, as I said, with with the, with the caveats of what might happen, like in the extreme IR, with some operator might decouple. Could you repeat the argument for why, why, why that is? Well, just it's the usual argument that, uh, like, uh, it's in a short multiplet, so it it cannot like. Uh, the nature of the multiplet will not change. But sometimes you can make more than one short multiplet, they can combine. Yeah, so, right. Um, <coughs> yeah, but, but, yeah, so it's, so you want to combine them in a longer multiplet. I don't know yeah, so yeah, but I think then the, the then the other multiplet should do, should already be there. And so I think that yeah, so if there is already another multiplet to which it can combine, then I think you're you're not in this um, in this case. Uh, okay, so uh, so now I can uh, jump to something different. Um, so what uh, we want to uh, put to use is, uh, well, let me erase something first. So now we want to put to use this uh, this structure that we have uh, 
we have uncovered uh, to like um, to explain uh, how to address the questions that we talked about in last lectures that is like given some supersymmetric field theory in flat space we would like to understand on which manifolds it can be placed preserving some supersymmetry and uh, what kind of uh, properties the resulting theory will have. So the references for this uh, part of the lectures. So there is this paper, 11.05.0689 uh, by Seiberg and myself. And uh, there is also a nice review by Dumitrescu, 1608-02957. OK. <clears throat> so let me start by um, talking about something somewhat trivial, but which I think um, gives an idea of uh, what is that we want to do in uh, supersymmetric theory. So we'll just give an example, which is without supersymmetry. <coughs> so let's consider some theory in flat space. Now we can, you can take your favorite theory, maybe just some scalar field. Then we can couple it uh, to gravity. Okay, so once you couple it to gravity, uh, the metric becomes dynamical, and uh, your theory will be diff invariant. Okay, so now the metric can be whatever you wish. So in particular, uh, you, can, you can imagine your theory being on some manifold of your choosing with some particular metric, and you can decouple gravity by sending the Planck mass to infinity. So now we can fix the metric and uh, on some manifold M and uh, the couple uh, the fluctuations of the metric by sending the Planck mass to infinity. <coughs> okay, so what I have done is that I've basically take, took my theory in flat space and I have coupled it to this, like, uh, on this manifold with some particular metric. <coughs> So now I can ask what happened to like uh, the diff invariance of the theory with gravity. Well, clearly fixing the metric uh, breaks uh, the diff invariance of the, of the original theory. But uh, there are some diffeomorphisms that, uh, that stay. In particular, all the diffeomorphisms which, for which, like, which do not change the metric that you have chosen as background will be uh, actual symmetries of the resulting theory. So and what are these? So if you look for a diffeomorphism for which the uh, change in the metric is zero, uh, that means that the infinitesimal parameter for the diffeomorphism, which is epsilon mu, has to satisfy the killing, the killing vector equation. So these are just isometries. of your Riemannian manifold. Okay, <coughs> so this is a somewhat uh, trivial example. You don't need to go through this series of steps in order to figure out that if you have a theory and you put it on some manifold with some isometry, then like it will have a symmetry corresponding to that isometry. But uh, so it's a way which explains what, uh, what we want to do in 
the more uh, complicated supersymmetric setting. <coughs> okay. Any questions on? No. Good. Okay, so one topic which will play a very important uh, role in the following is uh, that of uh, coupling some conserved currents uh, in your theory to background to background fields. So, for instance, in the in the example above, uh, you. Once you fix the metric, that the metric becomes a background field, and uh, if you look at the, at the deformation of the theory from flat space, then the deformation of the metric couples to the energy momentum tensor, which is one of the conserved currents uh, in your theory. So this is uh, a theme which uh, will uh, recur uh, during uh, the next few lectures. So I'd like to make uh, some. Uh, some comments uh, about this. Yeah. What happens with background metric under normalization? Under what? The normalization, RG flow. So the metric is a kind of couple, it's a collection of couplings. Yeah, so I'm, I'm fixing the metric to be some background. Right. You, you turn on the, the part, part of the loop effects, and the, the metric might get normalized. Operators are couples to. The first term is stress energy tensor, but there are higher other terms. So it's not weird. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it is true that uh, in, uh, I mean, in general, like there are lots of, uh, I mean, you can you you can always change. So the, the coupling to the metric is not universal. You can o always add terms which are suppressed by. One over R, where R is some scale in the manifold. So, and in principle, this could be generated during the RG flow. Right. So, so, but, so, so, so the metric itself may be not even observable, but you know, the, the metric. The metric is. The curvature, things like that. Uh, the metric is not an observable. We take it to be like a background field, which we fix. So, it couples to like objects in your theory. So, if I change the metric, this will. I mean, so if I take my theory coupled to like background metric and other background uh, fields, then I can, I don't know, say compute its partition function on some manifold, then taking functional derivatives of the result with respect to the background metric, this will give me information about correlators of various operators in the theory, right? That's kind of naive. Okay. So I mean, what's the difference between the metric and, let's say, the gauge coupling in young Mills theory? So you could say, well, young Mills coupling is also a kind of background field. Yeah. But we know it's not a parameter. You cannot compute the partition function as a function of the gauge coupling. It's, it becomes a scale if, you, if your theory is not conformal. What's the, so how is, how, is, how is the metric different from that? For example, could it be that as, 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 as we go down in RG flow, the, the background metric has to become flatter and flatter. So it eventually becomes just a flat space. Or maybe conversely, some concentration of curvature and it becomes similar. Okay, well, um, okay, I think okay. this is a choice of scheme what they are doing. They fix the curvature and it cannot change, but then other quantities, the way they renormalize, will be affected. And you can really think of it as a choice of scheme of the way you calculate your loops. It's like the opposite of a truth to pole mass scheme, it's somehow the opposite of that. When you say the fixed the curvature, that's, uh, I presume it's a constant curvature metric? Constant. Okay. So, that, constant. so that's a very special class of metrics with one, one feature only. I mean, if I think of a well, general form manifold, it has many features. You know, here it's one curvature, there it's another curvature. So what do I fix? But usually they will do sphere, so some very simple cases. 
No, that's for specific no, okay, discussion. Okay. So, so we just started with general discussion, so that's why I asked the general question. Yeah, okay, so let, let, yeah, let me continue, but I'll, I'll go back to this, uh, to this question. Like, okay. Um, so now, wh where was I left? Um, okay, so let's. Uh, I, I, w I wanted to make some comments about coupling to uh, background fields. Um, so, uh, as an example, again, without supersymmetry, we can consider some theory with a U1. Um, Uh, with some U1 uh, conserved, sorry, with uh, some U1 symmetry, um, then this uh, this will mean that your theory will have some conserved current J mu, and I can imagine uh, coupling this uh, conserved current uh, to a background. Uh, to a gauge field and then to make this gauge field non-dynamical. So, <coughs> okay, so then the structure of uh, your Lagrangian will be left the usual, the Lagrangian you started with and then you add the coupling of the background gauge field A mu uh, to your conserved current. But in general, this will not be enough. And uh, so uh, up to here, like this is uh, invariant under like gauge transformation of A mu because uh, J mu is conserved. But uh, this is true at first order. Like at higher order, you might have to add terms of order a squared, uh, which are usually called Siegel terms. Okay, so <coughs> again, these terms are here to like uh, preserve gauge invariance. So for instance, uh, if you do this for uh, a theory where the met Say, say you have some theory of scalars with a U1 symmetry, then like uh, these are the usual Siegel terms in uh, <coughs> scalar QED. <coughs> uh, another example is that that we talked a little bit about is that of the uh, energy momentum tensor. So let's take some theory with some a conserved energy momentum tensor, which is symmetric, then we can couple this uh, to uh, fluctuations of the metric. So if you take G mu nu to be flat space plus uh, linearized correction, then again, the structure of your theory will be just theory you start with plus the coupling of the linearized metric to the energy momentum tensor. Uh, but again, uh, in order to preserve diff invariance at higher order, you might, uh, in general, have to add more terms. <coughs> and uh, here we can also discuss what happens to this under improvement. So as we said in the last lecture, T mu nu uh, is, uh, even when we consider just a symmetric energy momentum tensor, can still be changed by improvement transformations. Uh, so, for instance, it uh, can be shifted by something of this form. This is not the most general improvement, but it is some improvement when, where u is some other scalar operator uh, in the theory. Uh, and then what uh, this does to this uh, deformation uh, is that it will add, so it it changes t here, but you can reinterpret the change in t by pulling the derivatives on h. And then this is just working as with the old t, but adding a coupling 
of uh, the linearized the Ricci curvature as a function of h to this scalar operator u. <coughs> so this makes the general point that by improvements I can shift the, um, the, the coupling uh, to the metric by terms which scale down like 1 over the radius to of the manifold to some power. So the Ricci curvature of the, of the manifold scales like 1 over r squared and uh, indeed, so the coupling of a theory to some, uh, to some curved space is not universal, but uh, it, uh, there are all sorts of uh, uh, one over other terms that can, be, uh, that can be changed. So for instance, they can be changed by improvements of the uh, conserved currents. <coughs> okay. Sorry. <coughs> yeah. um, in the S mass set, in the S mass set, you had a real scalar A, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and can you consider a similar? Uh, well, I, I think you can consider a similar linearized coupling in principle for A. And is the physical meaning clear in that case? Uh, okay. So to be fair, I don't remember what A exactly couples to in uh, in 1616 supergravity. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, in principle, there is. Uh, so there will be a will couple to some operator in your theory. Yeah, so sorry, a is an operator in your theory. It will couple to some field in the supergravity. Yeah. Um, which one? But, but uh, other than that, can you? See? Will there be any physical meaning other than okay? There is a coupling. Some, there is some coupling to some field. You know? Yeah, so that coupling in, so if you do background 16, 16 supergravity, that coupling would be required to preserve supersymmetry. So if it weren't there, like, you wouldn't have uh, supersymmetric field theory, but... Yeah, for, I mean, for, for other fields, like, uh, C mu, C mu, nu, or C mu, nu, 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 so then, then the, the physical meanings are clear, right? Yeah. The brain current. But uh, for, for A, no. Well, 16, super, 16 supergravity is a little bit uh, more complicated anyway because, uh, the, um, because there are more propagating degrees of freedom. So it's in particular, both in the FC multiplet and the R multiplet, A is determined in terms of the, it's either zero or it's determined by the trace of T. So. Um, okay, so the other wow. So the other example that I wanted to make before getting to the more complicated uh, supergravity case um, I? Uh, is that of the. Uh, so let's now add supersymmetry. And again, consider some supersymmetric field theory, which has a U1 flavor symmetry. So some U1 global symmetry, then that means that uh, this theory will have uh, a conserved current. Uh, let's call it J mu. Uh, corresponding to the symmetry, but because the theory is supersymmetric, the current will be part of a multiplet, exactly in the same way as the energy momentum tensor was part of a multiplet. Also, just uh, global symmetry will be part of a multiplet. Maybe this is actually an example I should have given before. So this multiplet is a linear multiplet, <coughs> and it contains other operators besides the, the, conserved, uh, the conserved current. So it can be embedded in a superfield J, which uh, satisfies the following constraints. So it's a real superfield which satisfies this constraint. And uh, so we can write J in components. So there is a bottom component, which I will call J again. 
um, which is a scalar, uh, real scalar. Then there are fermi fermions, uh, little j and uh, little j bar. And uh, finally, there is uh, in the top, in the component with theta and theta bar, there is the conserved, uh, the conserved current plus other stuff. <coughs> so again, there are uh, four bosonic degrees of freedom and four fermionic degrees of freedom. And uh, then these fields can be coupled to a uh, gauge multiplet. preserving supersymmetry. So again, uh, so the gauge multiplet contains uh, a U1 gauge field, uh, a mu. Then there is an auxiliary field D, which is a real scalar. And then there are gauge genus, lambda alpha and lambda bar a dot, alpha dot. And well, also these you can embed in a super f in a, in a super field, and you can write down super a supersymmetric interaction between uh, the fields in the gauge multiplet and the fields in the linear multiplet. So your Lagrangian will change uh, by something which will contain the bosonic term we discussed above, the coupling of the conserved current to the gauge field, but uh, it will also contain the coupling of the auxiliary field D to the scalar at the bottom of the multiplet. And uh, finally, it will uh, contain like uh, fermions. And uh, possibly uh, there will be Siegel terms. Okay, so now we can, we can think of making this uh, uh, gauge multiplet uh, non-dynamical. So we can set uh, the fermions in the gauge multiplet to zero and give some value to the a mu and d. But this in general will, will break supersymmetry. <coughs> so when is supersymmetry not broken? So So supersymmetry is not broken when the, um, when the supersymmetry variation of my chosen background uh, is zero. And what that means is that delta of a mu must be zero. But that's fine because uh, the, if you look at the supersymmetry transformations, the variation of a mu is always proportional to the gay genus. So because we sort them to zero, this will not give any constraint. Uh, the same thing for delta of the auxiliary field. It's also going to be zero because it's proportional to derivatives of the gay genus. So we only have to check that uh, the variation of the gay genus themselves uh, <coughs> is zero. And that will give rise to some uh, interesting constraint. So for instance, if you look at the variation of lambda, then we get that, uh, um, let me write it here. So there are two terms. So you get that uh, the variation of the Gagino is zero, provided that uh, this holds at least for some of the supersymmetry variation parameters. So that means that if you choose a background, which means that you choose some f mu nu and some d, such that this combination is zero, at least for some spin or zeta, then that spin or zeta will uh, generate a supersymmetry transformation of the resulting theory. <coughs> and OK, there is a similar equation for the variation of lambda bar. 
Okay, is there any questions so far? Uh, if we don't go to the Western Union gates, uh, we have a little bit more uh, more auxiliary fleets. Can this help us a little bit uh, or not? To have a bigger freedom for the spin or zeta that we have to pick? No, I don't think going, uh, I mean, this. You, you always want to write uh, gauge invariant interactions, so whatever thing brings you out of the Zumino gauge, I think, will be relevant. Yes? So when you say, and you get another equation from lambda alpha dot bar, yeah. is that essentially going to be the complex conjugate, or will you get any new actual constraints? Uh, well, okay, so if you work in Minkowski space, then they are related by compass conjugation. Okay, so you don't get essentially any new constraints on D in the gauge field from imposing that the other gauge unit has vanished from creation? But who said that the background has, should be real? Uh, again, uh, so if we work, so if we work in, uh, in Lorentzian space-time with usual reality conditions, then the background will be real. No, oh, but the background is just some coupling. Yeah, if you want some unitary field theory. Okay, but I, uh, but but indeed, like if we, when when we go to Euclidean space-time, then there is no reason why the background should be real. With okay, uh, so then indeed, uh, and besides, in in Euclidean space-time, when you take the compass conjugate of uh, zeta, you don't get zeta bar. So then like the background indeed can be complex and there is, uh, a, and indeed we will see it's important. So there are cases where it's useful to think about complexified background. Talking about the Grigio Minkowski makes much sense. Even the metric could be complex. It's, if it's just a perturbation of flat space Lagrangian, I could have complex conditions. No, what I'm saying is study this, the correlation functions of the operators to which my background couples, I should allow all possible couplings to be able to really differentiate the respect them. Right, but in a unitary field theory in uh, in Lorentz and flat space, like the various operators that can couple to this currents will satisfy reality conditions. Unitarity is a, it's a bonus of a special slice. Yes, yes, I agree. Then if you want to go beyond that, yes, then you can consider uh, also complexified deformations. <coughs> uh, good. Um, so the, the point is that then you should write another equation as well because they're truly independent. I agree, I agree. Then it, uh, it's especially, we, we will write both equations. Uh, um, okay, so Good, so now we can go to the supergravity case. So is there? Ah, ah, there it is. That's much better. Okay, so next. Uh, let's uh, consider the case with uh, with supergravity. So what uh, what we want to do uh, is indeed uh, to uh, couple some uh, some field theory with some um, with some supercurrent multiplet uh, to supergravity. Okay, so we take some n equal one field theory or some SUSY field theory in general. And we couple it to the appropriate uh, supergravity. Okay, so uh, the at the linearized level, this coupling can be described uh, quite uh, in quite some detail, and it will depend on the structure of the uh, supercurrent multiplet that, that the theory uh, has. So there will be the original theory you started with, and then there will be couplings 
uh, of the supergravity fields to the uh, operators that appear in the current multiplet. So for instance, you will have the coupling of the linearized metric to the energy momentum tensor, but then there would be various um, bosonic fields in the supergravity, let's call them bi, and this will couple to various objects in the, uh, in the supercurrent multiplet, which we will call ji. So again, in specific cases, this could be the string current or the domain wall current or the arc current and so on. Uh, then uh, I will have also couplings of the fermions. So there will be the gravitino, which couples to the supercurrent, the similar coupling for the other gravitino. And then there could also be other fermionic fields uh, in your supergravity, so those will couple to some fermionic operators in the uh, current multiplet besides S. And uh, finally, uh, there will can be Siegel terms, which are there, and you can, uh, you can discover by looking at uh, the entire supergravity supergravity Lagrangian. <coughs> okay. So some comments. So apart from the Siegel terms for which, I mean, in order to work this out, you actually need to like uh, work out the entire supergravity Lagrangian. Uh, all these uh, terms here uh, are completely dictated just by the uh, currents in the, in your multiplet. Uh, and uh, in particular, they can be described even for theories which don't have a Lagrangian. So if you have some theory, it, have, uh, it has some supersymmetry, it will have some supercurrent multiplet. In the supercurrent multiplet, they will use these operators and they will couple in this way to the various fields in the, in the supergravity. <coughs> so now, um, so this theory, uh, it's like a supergravity theory, so it has uh, it is invariant under uh, local supersymmetry transformations. And uh, these are parameterized by some spinors, zeta alpha, which depend on the position you are and your manifold, uh, and it's friend zeta bar alpha dot of x. <coughs> so now we want to proceed exactly in the same way as in the uh, trivial example we discussed uh, at, the, at the beginning. So we will set our background, uh, our background to whatever background of our choice. Uh, we will also set the um, the, in our background, we'll set the fermions to zero, so we'll set the gravitinos to zero. And then, uh, so we choose a background. So for the metric and the various uh, bosonic fields in the supergravity background, uh, we'll set the fermions in, super, in the supergravity to zero. And then we send the Planck mass to infinity to decouple the fluctuations of the supergravity fields. So what we are left with is some theory on some manifold with some metric, and there is going to be also various couplings of these fields uh, that appear. And uh, in general, this procedure breaks all the local supersymmetry. Uh, except, as we discussed in the previous cases, if uh, there are some of the local supersymmetries that uh, keep the background invariant, then these local supersymmetries will remain <coughs> in the theory once with the frozen supergravity fields. So what, uh, in order to figure out which supersymmetries remain, 
we need to uh, figure out uh, what are the conditions for uh, this background to preserve some of the local supersymmetries. But uh, luckily enough, uh, this is not uh, a very daunting task. Uh, what we have to check is the variations of all the various fields to be zero. But the variation of the bosonic fields in the supergravity are always proportional to the fermionic fields in the supergravity, which we have set to zero. So those are not going to give us uh, any equation to solve. So we only have to check that the variation of the fermions uh, is zero. And in particular, for the case of the minimal supergravities that we will be concerned with, we just have to check that the variation of the gravitino is zero. And its friend. So now this equation has a general structure so that we will see borne out in examples. So it starts with the covariant derivative of the spinor parameter zeta. Okay, and that has to be equal to some um, matrix M which depends on the metric and the various uh, other background supergravity fields, um, which acts on zeta. And then there can also be another piece, let's call it m tilde, uh, acting uh, on zeta bar. And there is a similar equation which comes out of the variation of the gravitino with the bars. So basically the task of uh, finding uh, which uh, manifolds allow for some supersymmetry uh, <coughs> just becomes the task of finding for which values of the metric and various auxiliary fields you can solve these equations or you can find some solutions. Uh, to these equations. So now I would like to make some comments on the, this equation and the general structure of them. So one uh, important comment is that this equation does not, um, does not really depend very much on which theory you started with because what uh, these uh, objects depend on are just the background supergravity fields. So there are no fields there are no matter fields inside these matrices. It's, uh, it's this because if you work off shell in the supergravity variation of the gravitino, you only have fields in the supergravity multiplet up here. You don't have fields in the matter multiplets. Uh, so this is an advantage of working off shell. So you can solve this equation and then the results that you have will apply to many different theories, not, uh, not just one. So now this is... Uh, so in some sense, finding supersymmetric backgrounds is independent of the theory you start with, except that this is not a completely correct statement because as we saw, depending on the theory you start, you have to choose a different supergravity to work in and the supergravities are not equivalent of shell. So depending on the theory you have, if the theory is an FC <coughs> multiplet, you will use old minimal supergravity and then you have one equation and uh, you can find a certain set of backgrounds which are supersymmetric. If the theory has an R multiplet, then you will have to use new minimal supergravity and you will find a different set of equations and a different set of solutions. Okay. Um, any questions on this? Can we just work with atomic supergravity instead of uh, you could decide to just work with conformal supergravity if you wanted to couple conformal field theories. Uh, but uh, I think... If you introduce compensated, you can also couple uh, non-conformal matter theory, right? Yeah, I think that's equivalent to working with the non-conformal supergravities, though. So, but I think it's actually important to use the non-conformal supergravities in, uh, in actual, comp well, first of all, you might be interested in like uh, coupling non-conformal theories. But even if you're just interested in conformal theory, many times, I mean, to do some computation, you might have to introduce some regulator. And then this regulator will like uh, introduce dependence on the 
will like break, I mean, usually breaks conformal invariance. So then in order to, uh, so then I think it's more appropriate to use the non-conformal couplings. So for instance, if you compute some partition function using some regulator, some regulator procedure, like there will be, this will depend on the, on the background fields but the possible dependence on the background fields will be like uh, we'll have to follow from like some there, there will be uh, the respect gauge invariance so they will like be dictated by some supergravity and uh, the appropriate supergravity I think is the non-conformal one so it's true that you can choose uh, the scheme uh, carefully so that like you will be left only with the couplings which preserve uh, which are conformal but that might be difficult in any specific scheme so but, but often physical questions are asked for uh, conformal they're just a conformal field theory right but for such questions does it make sense to try to give results or answers in terms of Somehow people don't, no, not many people don't seem to, many people seem to do this. I wonder why. Is there a good reason? No, well, I, as I said, I mean, uh, if you are just concerned with conformal field theories, then you can use conformal supergravity. Uh, up to this comment that like when you actually do some specific computation, you might have to introduce a regulator and this may break conformality. So. Is there a more supersymmetric way of analyzing this? Yes, there is. Yes, is so supersymmetric you mean can you work in superspace? Yes. Uh, so okay, so there is a the, the, there is a way which to, to encode all this in some superspace formalism and uh, I think you can actually find some some of it in this uh, book by Kuzenko which is called a walk through superspace or something, so I don't remember. But it has uh, it has some comments uh, about uh, about uh, about how to get supercurrents and how to um, yeah. So I have five minutes. Uh, so I don't know what can I do in five minutes. Let's see. Um, well, okay, so I can, I can give you, I guess, an example so that uh, this does not seem too dry. So let's see what happens uh, for a theory which has an FZ multiplet. So then, as we said, this theory will couple to naturally to old minimal supergravity. So then we can be a little bit more specific. So first of all, let me say that I'm uh, going to write uh, the couplings for, so you have some theory with an FZ multiplet. Uh, so the FZ multiplet that we discussed in the lectures, we had this uh, superfield Y alpha. Uh, but we said that in many cases y alpha can be written as d alpha of some chiral superfield x. So this is the case I'm going to consider. So then, like uh, the couplings that we wrote in the previous blackboard are going to be, okay, so there is going to be the coupling of the linearized metric to the energy momentum tensor. But then you have some coupling of uh, some auxiliary vector field in the supergravity, which we call B mu, to the non-conserved R current, which appears in the FZ multiplet. So this is a supergravity field, which um, maybe I can write the supergravity fields in a different color. Okay. So that's a field in the supergravity, which is an auxiliary field. Then we also have couplings of some other complex scalar auxiliary field in the supergravity to the bottom component of the multiplet X. Okay. 
And in this particular case, you can, we can also write down what are the uh, equations that come from setting the variations of the gravitino to zero. So here they are. This was not maybe the best idea. And there is another one for the right ended spin. -off. So here they are. So uh, as you see, the general structure that I advertised like, uh, is indeed borne out by this example. The, this equation, they only depend on the supergravity fields. OK, so now let me uh, make some uh, general comments, which uh, actually do contain, continue to be true in, uh, in other examples. So. If we look at some uh, specific manifold and uh, you like uh, solve these equations, then uh, you can indeed check that there is a scaling. All these fields, all the auxiliary fields in the supergravity multiplet M and B and M bar in this case, uh, scale like uh, one over R. So that's just given by their dimensions. So, uh, and again, this, uh, this same field M and B will also appear in the transformation laws of uh, matter, as we will see in the next lecture. So what that means is that in the UV, uh, the theory that we brought approaches a SUSY theory in flat space. If you want the original SUSY theory in flat space. So in, by using this formalism, you are not uh, going to obtain the formations of uh, the theory that you started with, which are present uh, even in flat space. So there are deformations of uh, the supersymmetry uh, of some theory that might be there even in flat space, and we are not going to obtain those uh, in, the, in this way. Um, and uh, the other thing is that, again, as we discussed before, if you improve the FZ multiplet, then this will uh, change the various currents which couple to these fields, and this will introduce uh, a different the difference is going to be in the couplings which scale as the radius of the manifold becomes big. So that's exactly as in the, as in the bosonic case. And uh, the final comment that I wanted to make, but which I've basically we already discussed, is that uh, it might be important uh, to consider cases in which like uh, the auxiliary fields, uh, or whatever, the fields in the background supergravity, uh, are not real, um, especially when you consider uh, the Euclidean case where like uh, the spinors are not related by complex conjugation. Uh, now, however, uh, to be fair, I never consider like uh, the case of a complex metric. So that uh, uh, might be something that uh, some of you can think about. Okay, um, that's it. <laughs>